February of 1862. In mid-February, Fort Donelson was captured by U.S. Grant, which opened up the Cumberland River all the way down to Nashville. So there was really no defense of this city after the fall of Fort Donelson. The Confederate commander at the time, Albert Sidney Johnston, had built a defensive line that ran all the way from Arkansas into Virginia. And the center of his line was in Bowling Green. Well, when they take Fort Donaldson here on the river, it forces Johnson to move all the way back. And when he moves all the way back, he realizes there's no way he can defend this city. Not against what will be about 25,000 federal soldiers and federal gunboats. And those gunboats begin the process of moving down the Cumberland River. The federal army begins moving toward Nashville, down from Kentucky, led by Don Carlos Buell. And on February 25th, the Federal Army makes its way to Edgefield, just across the river from Nashville. There's two ways to get across the river at that time via bridge. There's the railroad bridge, and then there was a suspension bridge. Well, when Johnson pulls out, he burns both of those bridges. So literally the only way you can get from Nashville over to East Nashville is by boat. And so the mayor of Nashville at that time, Robert Cheatham, decided he was going to surrender the city. And to do that, he had to get in a rowboat and row across the Cumberland River to surrender to Don Carlos Buell. Well, he gets there midday, February 25th. Buell's not there yet, and there's not high enough ranking officer to surrender the city to. So he has to come back. And then later in the afternoon, he gets on his boat and goes back over the Cumberland River and surrenders the city to the Federal Army. Once the Federal Army has control of Nashville, they begin the process of fortifying this city. And they begin to build a series of not only forts, but of entrenchments that are about 14 miles long. And they run really from the Cumberland River on the east, around the southern half of the city, to the Cumberland River on the west. The furthest fort which is Fort Gillum, was located on the Cumberland River where Tennessee State University is today. And if you move all the way around to this side of the river, this is the easternmost fortification, Fort Negley, and it was the largest. It's about four and a half acres in size. In March, Andrew Johnson, who had been a Tennessee governor and a Tennessee United States senator, he was the only senator from the South to remain in the Senate when those southern states seceded, which put him in very favorable light with Abraham Lincoln. Of course, Andrew Johnson was from East Tennessee. Mm -hmm. So Andrew Johnson becomes the military governor. He, along with Don Carlos Buell, feel it's important enough to hold this city that they begin building the forts. The biggest problem they have is they don't have a labor force. But when the Federal Army occupies Nashville, slaves from surrounding plantations, even as far south as Alabama, begin to flee to Nashville looking for protection for the Federal Army. Thousands of refugee slaves make their way into this city. The Federal Army doesn't really at first know what to do with them, so they set up a series of refugee camps. One of those refugee camps was just north of this position. Lo and behold, it also gives the Federal Army a ready-made labor force to start building the fortifications. And they do. They put those slaves to work to the point that they even go into Nashville and start rounding up slaves. They go into their churches on Sunday and pull them out of church to bring them out to the fortifications to labor on building these. In essence, slaves move from one master to another master. And that's going to really be the story of the African American story in the state of Tennessee until Tennessee writes a new constitution in 1866. And we'll talk about that. But the largest fort they build is this one. And the reason that this, this fortification is so important is because of where it sits. You overlook the Franklin Turnpike that we just came up on. You've got the Nolensville Turnpike. You've got the Murfreesboro Turnpike. You've got the junction right down here of the Nashville and Chattanooga and the Nashville and Decatur Railroads. All of those are within the range of the guns of Fort Negley. 
So you are literally protecting all of the access points into the city from the south from this installation. And there were about 1,500 men that were part of the garrison force at Negley. And not only was there a fort here, if you look where the reservoir is behind you, on the hill to the front was another fortification. It was a blockhouse made of wood. This fort up here is made of railroad iron, rock, and, and timbers. <coughs> and it was massive. It had an almost 350 foot bastion front of it that you could put about 600 men with rifles in. It had 11 different redans. And those are places where you put artillery. By the time you get to 1864, you got 30 pound Parrot rifles up there. They can fire a shot almost three and a half miles. And these guys are pretty accurate, even at three and a half miles. So this is a very deadly fortification. It's never attacked during the entire Civil War. The other fortification is where Rose Park School is today. Belmont's got the baseball fields up there. That was Fort Morton. When they did the excavation several years ago, they found the cannonball. Some of those remains still exist on this landscape around the city. You can still find things from the Civil War. You just dig in the right place. But Nashville, again, becomes fortified during that early period of the war that literally makes the city impregnable. Probably the only city in the entire war that's more fortified than this one is Washington. That's why this is such an important place. And whoever holds this city is going to win the war. If the Federal Army had lost control of Nashville, this war would have gone on. Now, if Lincoln had remained in office, he would have prosecuted it as long as he needed to. But they've got a refugee problem in Nashville like they do in a lot of other places. Lincoln eventually comes to the conclusion, being pushed by people like Frederick Douglass, to put these, what will eventually be refugees, into uniform. As what will become in the Western Theater, United States Colored Troops. A lot of the, union, a lot of the federal black units from the North, especially the Northeast, were volunteer units. Those were free blacks. We saw one of the films a few weeks ago, Glory. Anybody seen Glory? Of the 54th, Massachusetts. And almost all of those men were volunteer free blacks from the state of Massachusetts and Connecticut. They joined into that regiment. Out here, the vast majority of these soldiers, the overwhelming majority of these soldiers, are slaves. And I, I, the reason I say slaves is that when the Emancipation Proclamation is passed, ratified in January of 1863, it exempts the state of Tennessee. If you read the Emancipation Proclamation, it only covers those states and areas in rebellion against the United States. But because of the capture of Nashville, because of the Union armies moving on Memphis and they already control East Tennessee, Lincoln doesn't feel that the state of Tennessee is in rebellion. Well, of course it is, but Lincoln hopes to get this state back into the Union before the election of 1864. And the last thing he wants to do is to create a population of people, especially Union slaveholders, that are against him. So he's not going to take their slaves away from them. The ones that he does, he pays Union slaveholders for the labor of their slaves but not Confederate slaveholders. It's a very political maneuver on his part. But he knows what he's doing. He's trying to win the war and preserve the Union, and he doesn't care who gets in his way. Very savvy guy. Those men and some women that work on these fortifications really take a pounding. Almost 2,500 will work on building the Nashville fortifications. Six to 700 will die during that process. Most of them from exposure. They put them in camps, they give them very little cover. And so you have really this tragedy that's taking place in the city. But again, 
He's trying to win the war. Andrew Johnson's trying to win the war. Nashville will remain in federal hands until 1867. The federal army will still use this fort until that period. Which kind of gives away a little bit of the story when the Confederate Army comes in in 1864. It's not a very successful campaign back into Middle Tennessee. Any questions so far? All right, what we're going to do is we're going to get back on the bus. We're going to head over to the Lunette, which is the far left, excuse me, the far right flank of the Confederate line on the first day of the battle. We're going to talk about the, how we get to Nashville in 64 and the commanders that are involved. When we get over there, we'll start talking about the battle itself. Any, any questions?